there. Welcome to Chapters. How are you? Oh, good. That's great. Lovely. Um, are you looking for anything in particular? Do you need my help at all with anything? Mm. Oh, okay. Yes. A book always makes a lovely gift. Mm -hmm. um, how many are you looking for? Okay, okay, okay. Well, let's think. Um, why don't we start with what you want to get for your mom? Yeah? Okay, great. So, tell me a little bit about her. What does she like? Um, what kind of books does she like to read? And then perhaps from there we can think of something that she might like. Mm-hmm. So, she's into more of the non-fiction, would you say? Okay. Mm -hmm. And, um, any idea what kind of topics within that realm? Because, I mean, non-fiction is very broad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, okay, let me see. Do I have anything here that I can show you? Actually, have a few that I think she might like. So there's one. This is Janet Mock's kind of biography or autobiography. Um, she wrote it, and it's all about her life. Um, Janet Mock is a transgender woman who is freaking beautiful. I think at least, <laughs> and um called Redefining Realness, and throughout the book, she talks about how she personally really redefines realness. Um, so, for instance, a lot of people kind of call transgender people less real than cisgender people, and she talks about how she kind of redefines that reality, and a lot of other things. It's a, such an interesting book. She has been through so many things, and it blows my mind how um, she managed to kind of push through all of those things. Um, I personally, I read this, and I could not put it down. She has very, very organic, she has a very, very organic way of writing. Um, it's the kind of thing that I just can't seem to put down, and it's also written more so in like a conversationist conversational way. It's not really like it is still a standard book, but it's very smooth. It's a very easy read um, in terms of like language, but uh, you will probably cry throughout because it's very, um, if you really, if you find that you're able to really feel for her and the things she went through, it can be very emotional. Um, and also, like, I know I've been through some of the things she's been through in the book, and it made me very emotional. Um, yeah, but it's a very good book, and I would really recommend it. Um, let me tell you what it says on the back, okay? Um, in this profound and courageous New York Times bestseller, Janet Mock establishes herself as a resounding and inspirational voice for the transgender community, and anyone fighting to define themselves on their own terms. With unflinching honesty and moving prose, Mock relays her experience of growing up young, multi multiracial, poor, and trans in America, offering readers accessible language while imparting vital insight about the unique challenges and vulnerabilities of a marginalized and misunderstood population. Though undoubtedly an account of one woman's quest for self at all costs, Redefining Realness is a powerful vision of possibility and self-realization, pushing us all towards greater acceptance of one another and of ourselves, showing as never before how to be unapologetic and real. And then there's like a bunch more um, reviews that people have said, like it's really raw personal history, um, trailblazing memoir, and then there's even a little bit about her. 
so I think that your mother would really like this. Um, and it's also a good thing for, I guess, the older generation to read because, um, obviously it's a little bit younger for me. Um, this kind of stuff is very easy for me to understand and, like, because I've grown up with it. But, um, something like this I think will help the older generation feel a bit more sympathetic and understanding to trans people and just people in general that they don't necessarily understand or relate to. So I think it would be a very nice book. What do you think? Alright, so we'll think about this one then. Oh, it is so, so interesting. And very, very um, empowering too. So, I think that's a good option. Um, I'm just trying to think about what other books I think she might like sticking with the kind of non-fiction. Um, I can think of a couple other history ones that she might like, um, and also some more kind of scientific ones. Um, what do you think? Okay, let me show you some more in the history realm of books, and then from there we can decide if we want to move into other kind of areas of uh, nonfiction. Okay. So I have this other one called Replaceable You by David Serlin. And this is basically about um, post-World War II America and the way that bodies were changed, altered, replaced. All things that are uh, more common now but were quite new back then. So, um, as you can see from the f picture on the front here, uh, one of the topics is um, wounded soldiers coming back from the war and like amputees and um, all the different kind of fake arms and other limbs that were used and invented and the history behind that and how it affected them emotionally. It's very well written. It's not super facty. It's very interesting. Um, I really, really liked this book. Um, what else do they talk about? They talk a little bit about the Hiroshima Maidens and the kind of, um, alterations that were made to them and as well to the Japanese, the way Japanese people were viewed after the war versus during the war when they were very um, villainized and made to see like animals and then afterwards it was very feminized um, which is a very interesting thing to look at it talks about um, Christine Jorgensen, I believe that's her name she was the first, I don't know, I guess famous transgender person, maybe woman she was like, everybody knew who she was, and this was like 1950s, and it's when it made like to be, at the time I don't think they used the term transgender, I think it was transsexual, I'm not sure, um, but it made that kind of idea a household term. Um, it wasn't fully understood, and I mean when they found out that Christine didn't have like, didn't get full bottom surgery, or I don't remember, people completely turned on her, uh, so Christine really paved the way for transgender people and she was so strong. I say was, I'm not sure if she's still alive, but um, it's very interesting. So they talk about her. What else do they talk about? I don't know, but this is a very, very interesting read and again, it's written very well, so it's very interesting. So your mom might like this, and again, it's from a bit of an older time, so perhaps she can relate a bit more to it. I don't know how old your mom is, but um, potentially, I guess maybe her parents would have gone directly through this kind of stuff, unless she's very old. <laughs> so yeah, what do you think? Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, well, I have this one that I haven't read. 
can see it's by Frank Welsh. It's the history of the world from the dawn of humanity to the modern age. Um, it's quite thick, but considering how much history there is in the world, I am interested to know specifically what he talks about. I don't know. Let's see. There's some kind of section in the middle with some images. Looks like some kind of Egyptian or very old, what is this? Sumerians, Romania, Chinese oracles. Yeah, so it's literally the whole world, not um, just Western history, which is what we normally see. Um, but the, there is still Aristotle, um, Athenians, King Richard of England. Oh, wow, or is the execution of Muslim prisoners? I wonder what that's about. The world was crazy back then. But yeah, so it's a good kind of overview of the history of the world. Um, I'll tell you what it says in the back, okay? In a narrative beginning almost 1.5 million years ago, with the emergence of Homo erectus, Frank Welsh, father, takes the reader from the Middle Ages to the Enlightenment from the Industrial Revolution to the War on Terror. Oh, interesting. Okay. Using his masterly storytelling skills and drawing on the latest scholarship, he recounts the epic story of human growth, survival, and achievement across all continents and ages, providing insight into the lives of ordinary people in every corner of the globe. This comprehensive book is the perfect introduction to the human history of our planet. Um, so yeah, I, like I said, I haven't read this book, so I can't really say how, um, interesting or well-written it is. Can't really say how interesting or well-written it is, but we only saw the best of the best here at Chapters, so I'm sure it's fine. But perhaps I'll read you a little excerpt. Okay, so it starts off with some maps, I guess, from the different time periods. Alright, here's the introduction. Genesis. Where should history of the world begin? Strictly speaking, perhaps about four billion years ago, when the first life forms might have appeared, and with no apologies to the credulous millions who passionately believe in the Bible chronology. More practically, we could start some two million years ago when one branch of the Australopithecines, the southern great apes, developed some skills in stoneworking, which helped them, their descendants, move out of Africa, where we all began. But 1.5 million years ago, Homo erectus, a much more advanced creature than any of the great apes, wandered over vast distances, reaching China and Java in the east, and France, Spain, and England at the other end of the continental landmass. The tools he developed were so useful that they passed on almost unchanged for more than a million years. To, to 100,000 BP, by far the longest period of human history and spread over all the inhabited world, they were first unearthed by the 18th century antiquary John Frere, fellow of Gaius College, Cambridge. It would prove to be a hand axe, the multi-purpose tool that enabled man to survive. Axe is perhaps misleading, since the tool, usually triangular but sometimes ovoid or circular, with one or two cutting edges up to 25 centimeters long, could be used for slicing or scraping as well as chopping or cleaving, with smaller flakes serving as spear points or for finer work. The hand simply signifies the absence of a haft, a later development. Okay, so those are three history books. Um, if you want to go for something a bit more classic, like I said, the history of the world. It's very kind of straightforward history. If you want to learn a little bit more about the people side of things and societal 
essence of the society um, post-war America. This one is very good. And again, kind of along that theme, uh, more personal history. Like I said, this is so, 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 so well written and very entertaining and I can't imagine anyone not liking it. Um, do you want me to pull some more or do you think one of those might work? Hmm? Okay, for sure, think about it. I, okay. Okay, so you're thinking Janet Mock for now. We'll keep those other ones here just in case you change your mind. Mm-hmm. Okay. No worries. Sounds good to me. Like I said, it really is such a good book. I love it. Okay. And now, who was the other person we were looking for? Her best friend. Her birthday, too. And then, who was the other person we were looking for? Your best friend. Okay, it's their birthday, too. Okay, great. Um, what kind of books are they into? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, okay, okay. So definitely fiction. All right. Um, any preference? Are they more into, like, the classics or more kind of modern, um, you know, teenage, young adult kind of fiction. A bit of both. Okay. <laughs> well, um, what do you think they would prefer? Classic, maybe? Okay. Sounds good to me. Um, let's see. I've got a couple here that I think Definitely classics. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we'll start with this. This is Bodily Harm by Margaret Atwood. This is my own copy, so that's why it looks a little used. Don't worry, we'd get you a nice fresh one. Um, and again, I haven't actually read this, but I'm sure it must be very good. Um, but let's see what it's about. A powerful and brilliantly crafted new novel from the author of Life Before Man, The Edible Woman, and Lady Oracle. Body Harm is the story of a young Toronto journalist whose life begins to shatter around the edges. Rennie Wilford flies to the Caribbean to recuperate. On the tiny island of St. Antoine, she encounters a world where her rules for survival no longer apply. By turns comic, satiric, relentless, and terrifying, Margaret Atwood's new novel is ultimately an exploration of human defensiveness, the lust for power, both sexual and political, and the need for a compassion that goes beyond what we ordinarily mean by love. The Globe and Mail said that Rennie is Atwood's most believable and memorable character. This is her most satisfying novel yet. So, yeah. Sounds interesting. And it's cool that they're from Toronto. Do you want to maybe read a page? This is how I got here, says Rennie. It was the day after Jake left. I walked back to the house around five. I'd been over at the market and I was carrying the shopping basket as well as my purse. There wasn't as much to carry now that Jake wasn't there anymore, which was just as well because the muscles in my left shoulder were aching. I hadn't been keeping up with the exercises. The trees along the street had turned and the leaves were falling onto the sidewalk, yellow and brown. And I was thinking, well, it's not so bad. I'm still alive. My next-door neighbor, an old Chinese man, whose name I didn't know, was tidying up his front yard. The yard in front of my house had been covered over with paving stones so you could park a car on it. That meant the street was going up rather than down, and in a few years I'd have to move, though I'd stopped thinking in years. My neighbor had pulled up the dead plants and was raking the earth into a raised oblong. In the spring, he'd plant things I didn't know the names for. 
I remember thinking it was time I learned the names if I was going to live there. Okay, so wondering a little more about her. It sounds interesting. Yeah. Alright, now another classic which I have actually read is 1984 by George Orwell. Um, I believe this was written in like, I think 1948. Um, yeah, it's still very, very relevant. Very, very interesting now. Yeah. And anybody that hasn't read this, I think, needs to read it right now. <laughs> so, um, I don't know if your friend has read this, but if they haven't, we need to get them this. Um, so I'm gonna read you what it says in the back, because it has been a while since I read it, and I just wanna give you the most accurate kind of rendition of it. The year 1984 has come and gone, but George Orwell's prophetic nightmarish vision in 1949 of the world we were becoming is timelier than ever. In 1948, oh 1948, 1984 <laughs> is still the great modern classic of negative utopia, a startlingly original and haunting novel that creates an imaginary world that is completely convincing from the first sentence to the last four words. No one can deny the novel's hold on the imaginations of whole generations or the power of its admonitions, a power that seems to grow, not lessen, with the passage of time. Um, it's basically just this crazy, effed up world, um, kind of communist, but like the really negative kind, very controlling. I'm pretty sure, if I remember rightly, there's like a big brother, which is where like the name for that show comes from. And they kind of watch you and you have to follow them and it seems like a very scary world to live in but very very real and um, some people do live like that in places around the world um, and yeah it's super duper interesting so yeah um, any thoughts on that yeah I totally agree okay so this is number one, but um, do you want me to tell you some other ones that I'm thinking might work as well? Mm hmm So this is another classic. I haven't read either of these I want to show you. Um, this one is called Lolita by Vladimir Nabo Nabokov. And this is the 50th anniversary edition that we're selling at the moment. Uh, I don't really know exactly what it's about, but I know that it's supposed to be very, very good and, again, a classic, everyone should read it type of book. So, again, I'll read you the back. Awe and exhilaration, along with heartbreak and more and wit, abound in Lita Vladimir Nabokov's most famous and controversial novel, which tells the story of, an a of the aging Humbert Humbert's obsessive devouring and doomed passion for nymphette Dolores Hayes. Most of all, it is a meditation on love. Love is outrage and hallucination, madness and transformation. I think I've actually read a few chapters at the beginning of this book, if I'm remembering rightly, and there's like this guy who, I don't know, takes her, I can't remember, but yeah, he's like super in love with this really young girl. Or something like that. But <laughs> again, it's supposed to be a classic and um, one that everyone should read. So it's definitely on my to read list. Uh -huh. So, yeah. also that one. And then the other one I wanted to show you is by Jane Austen called Sense and Sensibility. Again, it's a world classic, so can't go wrong. I don't know if I've read this, but I do know that I've read other things by Jane Austen, and they're all very good. Um, I'll read you what it says in the back here. Alright, so on the back here, it talks not so much about the story, but a little bit about her. So it says, I'm, this is a quote, I'm never too busy to think of sense and sensibility. I can no more forget of it 
than a mother can forget her sucking child. Um, so wrote Jane Austen to her sister in April 1811, while the sheets of the first edition were coming off the press. Disappointed in her first two attempts to publish a novel, Jane Austen had turned to a work which she had started many years earlier, Eleanor and Marianne. The story was renamed Sense and Sensibility and was the first of her novels to be published. While the story centers on the personalities of the two sisters, whose contrasting temperaments are examined as they undergo comparable experiences in the loss of the men they love, it rejoices also in a wealth of minor characters and incidences described with Jane Austen's typical witty insight and humor. Um, yeah, so like I said, Jane Austen is an amazing author. I've read a few by her, not this one, but if, um, if the other ones are any indication, this is going to be a very, very good read, so it's definitely one I recommend. Mm, yeah. Okay, okay, so what is the verdict, do you think? Okay, for your friend, you're thinking 1984. Mm-hmm. Keep those other ones in mind um, for a later event or gift giving. And then, what do you think for your mom? You're still gonna go with Janet Mox? Okay, great. All right, well, I'm so glad I could help you. Is there anything else that you need since I'm here? Mm-hmm. Well, awesome. I'm glad I could help. I hope that they both really like their books that you got them. I'm sure they will. <laughs> um, but you can always get a gift receipt at the checkout. Alright. Yeah, so just take these up to the checkout. And just ask for a gift receipt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Alright. It's lovely to meet you and hope I see you again.